Okay, so thank you. So I was asked to talk about relations between other fields like my field of algorithmic game theory and verification. And there is a little problem there that I don't know much about verification. <laughs> uh, and also I believe that the, the relations between these two fields are really in their infancy. So there is very little known, so I know that Orna did a few works on that. But uh, really there is not much there. So instead, uh, like we you know all professors do, I will talk about what I can know. Uh, which is I'll talk about my field, but uh, I'll do two things to sort of connect it. First of all, I want to start, I'll basically present two of the very, very basic examples of my field that are sort of motivation for our field. And I said, uh, so the risk is that many of you will know them. Uh, those that don't, that, that will be great to learn these two very simple examples. Uh, but the second thing that I'll try to do, I'll try to philosophize a bit at the high level of what do I think that these kind of examples, these kind of ideas, mean for the rest of computer science and especially for what I view as verification, which is not very related to the field of verification as you guys know it, but hopefully it's not completely disjoint. <coughs> okay, so I will talk about, I'll try to, I will start with an extremely high level view, what is computing? Uh, from the point of view of AGT, what is the interesting thing about computing that we do in AGT and algorithmic game theory is different from the rest of computer science and the rest of verification for that matter. And then I will talk about two examples, one of them showing the concept of rationality, rational players and the equilibrium they get into, and the second talk about what is a mechanism, mechanism in the sense of mechanism design, uh, a subfield of economics. Okay, so the, you know, classical a model of a computer was there is an input and there is some kind of CPU and you put it input and you get output out of it. Uh, and the, mo the focus one on what a computer can do. I think in the 21st century we're more interested in the interaction between different computers. So our model about computation is no, not, I mean our now, not just in our field, is not so much about what a single computer can do, that's maybe the building block from it, which we of course must understand in order to do anything else, uh, but really the interesting thing is the interaction uh, between computer, different computers. <coughs> now the interaction between different computers is of course uh, many, many parts of computer science uh, deal with that, the distributed computing if you wish, uh, in the very wide sense of distributed computing, and I think also the field of formal verification really uh, it focuses a lot about the interaction between a computer or a system and other parts of it, so this is not uh, unusual, neither in computer science or in other places. What's really uh, unique about my field of algorithmic game theory is that we're considering not just the fact that the different parts may behave differently, but that the different parts have differing goals. So we're really thinking about systems that each part of the systems belongs to a different entity. And this belongs, I mean, we don't care so much about the, you know, the legal notion of property, but, so, but re what we really uh, care about is the fact that when they act, basically run the program that their owner put in them, they will probably act the way that the owner wants them to act. So we're suddenly in a situation where different parts of a system are not designed together, but on the other hand, uh, each one has their own goals. And that's a unique uh, perspective of algorithmic game theory, which we feel is uh, really important to understanding systems, for example, on the internet or any modern system. So let me uh, start with two examples. And the first one is called the minimi is a brass paradox. Uh, how many people have, no, have heard about the brass paradox? Okay, somewhat less than one half, which is good. Okay, <coughs> okay. So here is the story. So our story is a network, and originally this was literally a network of roads. So you can think of each one of this as a road, and now we're thinking about a network of computer network, where you have a bunch of packets that need to get from here to here. And they have various routes, so they can go this way, they can go directly that way, and so on. The, uh, the network works like this. There is one great link. You immediately, with zero delay, with zero latency, you can go from here to here or here from here. This is like the most expensive link, and it immediately just goes there. Now, there is these links, which... Uh, 
<clears throat> usually you think about them as very wide but long roads. Okay? So the amount of time it takes you to get from here to here is one, you know, if you're talking, thinking about roads, one hour. If you're talking about packets, one, I don't know, millisecond, picosecond, whatever you want, one, one second for us. Okay? And now there are these kind of roads, which we have x over them, and you can think about them as short but narrow roads. So the time to get from here to here is a function of the basically congestion on them. The more cars try to go from here to here, the more time it will take. And the function that uh, basically maps the congestion to the delay is here x. So if 30% of the packets decide to take this edge, then it will take 0 0.3 seconds. OK? Is this clear? Good. So this is the story. And now again, the important thing for our point of view, each one of these packets, each one of these cars, has their own utility. They are just interested about how can they get as quickly as possible to their common destination. So that's the story. <coughs> so now, uh, and we're assuming everyone knows everything. So immediately they're all connected by ways. They know where exactly where everyone is. Full information. Now, what will happen? So here are two things that may happen. <coughs> so first, the first example is a standard computer science solution. Suppose that we try to make sure that everyone simply gets as quickly as possible to their destination. And we're assuming here that there are no other considerations. The only thing that people care about is getting as quickly as possible to their destination. Then I would basically take half the people, put them here, and keep on going here. Half the people going here. So we would get this thing. Half of the people going on the top route. Half of the people going on the bottom route. This x now takes one half of a second. So everyone gets to their destination in 1.5 seconds. So this is like the normal computer science solution. <clears throat> but what happens when players are selfish? That is, players only think about themselves. Where will you go? Suppose you know this situa situation, and now you're a packet <coughs> here. How will you drive to work? So the answer is, I will first take this route, then cut here, which doesn't take any time, and then cut here, and I will reach in one second. And in fact, that's what I will do as long as this is less than one, strictly less than one. Even if this is 0 0.99, I would still take this kind of thing. Okay? So really, the only, if you wish, equilibrium, if you let people play according to what they want, be selfish, <coughs> this is what will happen. Everyone will take this route, everybody will go down, everybody will continue here, but then what happens? It takes two. Everybody reaches a time two rather than a time one and a half. Okay? <coughs> so this is a really, a <coughs> but that's a, that's really an interesting kind of thing. So this is what happens, this is the difference between a selfish world where different parts of the system behave in their own, according to their own private goals and a coordinated solution. Okay, so what? Why is this so interesting, I think, uh, this difference? <coughs> so first of all, this, is, uh, this kind of example has been known for a long time and economists sort of like it, but they were never really interested in it. Uh, because, first of all, for an economist, of course, different people act selfishly. That's the whole model of economics. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, the word selfishly is like a computer science term we brought into this. Economists call it rationally, and they mean exactly the same thing. <laughs> okay? It's uh, completely equivalent rational and selfish, and I will continue to use selfish and rational as the same as two equivalent words. Okay? So, of course, people act rationally. So, I mean, what do you think? You're, why would you ever want to analyze a system from the point of view that everybody wants the same thing? It would seem a very weird to an economist. Also, the fact that when everybody does what they want, the situation, the global situation is not optimal, they can hardly... So that's a little bit more interesting to an economist, but that's very well known what's called the tragedy of the commons, that if you have, like, a public field, and you can just, you know, a public field, and you can, your cow can just go there and eat the grass that belongs to everyone, then everybody will just go there and no one will have anything remaining. But this so example is not about externality. This is exactly externality. Why is this not about externality? So why, why is it 
where did the problem of everybody going to two? Because when I decided to go here, my externality was that I slightly made you take a longer time. Okay? So it's exactly externality. Because I took the shortest route, I didn't want to hurt you, but because I took the shortest route, then I congested this other this thing and hurt you as well. So it's really just a, a slightly more complicated example of externalities. And you know, the tragedy of the commons is a very simpler, it's a simpler ex demonstration of this fact. So, so economists were not really uh, surprised by this either. And of course, economists know exactly what you need to do when there are externalities. You have to either regulate or tax or do something to align basically the incentives. Yes? How different it is from the prisoner's dilemma? It's, uh, it prisoner's dilemma is another example. It's another example of externalities that, of course, the equilibrium is bo bad for both of them. That's another example of the same phenomena. Can you explain what's an externality? Or <coughs> okay, so an externality is when I act, do I also affect you? Okay, so if we both in a different parts and don't, then there are no externalities. But if I'm a, if I pollute, then that may hurt you. <coughs> That's a economics word. Okay, so of course they know we need to do something to align. You can regulate, you can tax, it's something like that. But I think that the computer scientists really uh, were much more interested in this example in general in the early days of the field. Um, <coughs> One of them, because it really puts a different kind of question into our mind, how do you handle even, how do you even think about these kind of systems where different parts have different goals? So we've become accustomed to, uh, to, un to analyzing systems where parts of them can be broken, parts of them can be adversary, and so on. But how can we even try to analyze systems according to their goals? That's a new kind of uh, thought here. <coughs> and also, uh, so I don't know if we were so stunned by the fact that selfishness is a problem, that when you actually try to run, al well, actually, I think it was stunning for us. So when people designed TCP, for example, TCP built in is the fact that everybody sort of plays nice. If you don't play nice, if you want to optimize your TCP that will give you the best performance, which basically takes changing about one or two lines of code somewhere in the Linux kernel, then you can really screw everyone else. Okay? So it's really, a, you know, selfishness is really a big problem for systems. And we computer scientists sort of always assume that people play nicely. Uh, because we're sort of engineers and engineering, you think, oh, we design it correctly. And of course, everything that we design will be implemented except for the adversaries, which we know how to analyze. Uh, <coughs> and then, of course, uh, while economists basically think that they figured out exactly how to, to fix these kind of things, you know, align the incentive, do regulation or tax, of course, for, for an engineer, for us computer scientists, to solve these issues, it's much more complicated because really we sort of want like an exact recipe algorithm that for any scenario will tell you exactly what to do. So we need a much more specific answer than economists can give. So this was really interesting. And this is really a challenging point of view. <clears throat> and I think that really one of the, uh, probably the, the, the single paper that I would say had most influence on, my, on the whole field of algorithmic game theory is, an early, is a paper about 15 years ago by Rafgard and, and, and Eva Tardosh, Tim Rafgard and Eva Tardosh, that proved the following completely general uh, result. Take any network, any number of nodes, any number of edges, Assume any routing pattern, so you know, x packets need to get from here to here, and others need to get from here to here, so you have any arbitrary kind of pattern of communication that you need to do. Put any kind, each one of the, each one of the edges can have any kind of delays, as long as it's a linear function, you know, maybe 2 plus 3 times x according to the or something like that. And then, <coughs> see what happens selfishly, and they say, oh, it's not so bad, it's only 33% higher than the optimal kind of thing. Okay, so that was the result. A fine, a fine, a fine, but with a positive, uh, positive coefficients. Yes. <coughs> okay, so this is really, uh, I would say, really uh, amazing. I, I, I really, I still am amazed by this, even though it's like one of the earliest results in the field, because suddenly we are able to do analysis on systems where different parts do whatever they want. 
So it's really amazing that you can do this kind of analysis. And not only that, but you also have the phenomena that even though the different participants do basically what they want, still the result is OK. okay? So this is like the first kind of thing that drives our field. Uh, and what are the, uh, so I think there are two interesting points of view, which I would uh, love to know, you know, how can that play with formal verification? I think there is an interesting question about many parts of computer science, how to connect with them. So uh, the first one is that we're sort of used to good player, bad player kind of thing. So the good player is the one that runs my protocol. The bad player is either the computer that stopped working or the actual adversary, cryptographic adversary, just wants to hurt me. Sometimes maybe a computationally bounded adversary, but there is a good and bad, and that's how we analyze things. And now there are suddenly rational players, and the rational players do what they want, but what they want is not necessarily to hurt me. But they have some kind of logic behind what they do, they have kind of, and that's what they're doing. Okay? And the question is, okay, so how and, and this is a real, very, very realistic scenario. And the question is, can we do anything better than just assuming total adversaries, adversaries with these kind of things? And these rational players is, I mean, there are various places to look at it within systems. You can think about the good players being rational instead of good. And you can think of the bad players being rational instead of good. The first one makes life harder for you. The second one makes life easier for you. <coughs> How exactly and what goes on there, I think that's an interesting thing that's still open. <coughs> Uh, the second kind of thing is uh, that we're looking at basically a notion of equilibrium. So if you look at this thing, when do you get to this? This is basically what happens after almost any reasonable dynamics as long as people basically do what they want. Okay? So we have this notion that a system will get to equilibrium, even though I didn't explicitly talk about you know, the process of how we, would, uh, how we would expect people to go there. So instead of like an algorithm that does something and reaches a situation, now we have this notion of equilibrium that it has to get there. And that's another, I think, quite interesting uh, concept uh, for us computer scientists. Again, it has, you know, it, it raises new problems and other, and, and so there are various types of ways to look at it. So one is, of course, there are these questions, of, are you going to get to an equilibrium? How quickly? Uh, what happens in the way there? And there are questions, okay, now that we have an equilibrium as a concept of itself, a solution concept, sort of, we do believe that in a certain system we will reach something close to equilibrium. Okay, can we analyze what happens there? So that's another high-level point of view that I think is sort of interesting. <coughs> okay, let me get to the second uh, example that I want to talk about. And this is what's uh, called the field of mechanism design, which is a subfield of, mi of, of uh, microeconomics. Uh, sometimes it's called like the econ economist as an engineer. And here is the problem. <coughs> so the problem is the following. We have this picture. This is mine. I'm a very good guy. I'm the government. I'm a good guy. The only thing that I want for this picture is to go to whomever wants it more. will get more pleasure from having the picture. Now, this guy is willing to, it gets $5 worth of pleasure. And this guy gets $8 worth of pleasure. And the, question, and, now the, and the question is, I want to make sure that I give it to the guy who makes most use of it. Now, this is a problem that's very generic. The standard kind of thing will be within a computer system. You have a resource, and there are like two different possible uses of that resource. And the different possible uses now don't come from the same person with, for different parts of what he's doing, but from two different people with two different agendas, two different goals. And the question is, which one of them will get the resource? And if I'm a good engineer, the only thing that I care about, of course, the one that will get more utility, that the resource will help him more. And the question is, how do we give the resource? So the answer is, well, 8 is greater than 5 if we give it to this guy. Now, the problem here is that because these guys are self-interested, they are doing what's good for them, they will not tell me these real numbers. And now the question is, how without them, because they know how much utilities they're going to get from it. I don't know. How do I know with who to give it to? Okay, so that's a problem. Just set up the <coughs> price and keep lowering it and lowering it and someone who's willing to pay that price they just uh, Okay, and soon we can talk about why that won't work very well. But let's start with the... 
here's something that could be nice. If there were God, and he would tell us any, some number between these two numbers, okay? So, suppose we knew somehow that there's only one person that's willing to pay more than six dollars. Here is what I could do. I would say, anybody who's willing to pay six dollars can take the picture. And only one of them would say, oh great, I want to take it, because this guy would say, no sorry, I only get five dollars of pleasure and this cost me six. Uh, but this guy will say, oh yeah, great, I'm willing to pay six to get it. So if I may manage to find any number in this range, I would know how to, uh, of course, allocate the item. And notice that the fact that I get six dollars uh, is not important for this part of the talk, or is not important at all, basically, because uh, I'm just a good guy, I don't care about the money. But it's important that I charge them the money because otherwise the incentives will not be right and it will no be, there will be no way to guarantee that only one person gets it. Okay? So I charge the money and then I don't know, I burn it or donate it to something or keep it for myself. It doesn't matter for this story. But this is what we do. Okay. So how can we get this six dollars? The point is this, the fact that we have, so this will be like a market prices and we know that market prices can allocate the goods well. But the question really is, how do we get this number? How do we find the market prices? And the mechanism is something that's supposed to find these market prices. Okay, so we want to find some kind of protocol, you know, where these two guys talk with me and maybe with each other and do things. And at the end of this very concrete protocol, then we can get the allocation. And the question is, how do we do that? Okay, so let me first start with uh, uh, a few bad examples. Exam suggest the number one. The protocol is tell me how much this is worth for you, tell me how much this is worth for you, and I'm going to give it to the guy who gave me a bigger number. Why is this not good? Privacy. No, no privacy. No, the, only, the only considerations we have here is that I wanted to go to the, to the best, to the one with the highest thing, and these guys are just only care about their own happiness, they don't care about privacy. Yeah. The second one has the advantage that the, the first one I would pay five dollars, the second one says I would pay five dollar one cent, and you get six, so you can minimize the value. No, I so no, sorry. My my my, my first suggestion <coughs> did not ask him how. I did not charge anything. I just asked him, tell me how much you're willing to pay, and I'll give it to you, and it won't take money. If That's they don't care about money. They will just offer high numbers. Exactly because. Since they are, of course, rational, selfish, rational, it's all in the eye of the beholder, if they know that they can give me a number and not pay it, of course this guy will say a billion, this guy will say two billion. Okay, so what's bad with that? The point is that there is no way to make sure that this guy will say the two billion and this guy says a billion rather than the opposite way. Good. Okay, so just the number two, the guy who tells me his price will have to actually pay it. So I ask him, how much is it worth for you? And if you win, you pay exactly what you said. Okay? Why would that not work? And if you worry about the order, let's say each one of them needs to whisper in my ear, so we have a protocol, they speak concurrently where the other guy is not listening. For this suggestion, they are not communicating. Later, but in general, I may allow communication, but my, my second proposal, that each one says how much he's willing to pay and then we'll pay it if he wins, they're not communicating, that's just specific protocol. What's wrong with that? Yes. No, okay, so, you know, for my goals now, so what you're saying is, is correct maybe in the grander scheme of things, but from my point of view now, I don't care about anything except that the item goes to the right person. I don't care if they pay a lot or a little. Neither do they even, in, for my example here. Ah, okay, right. So, so, okay, so one thing that you're saying, this is a problem with my general modeling, that they have a single parameter, how much do you want it, and you say sometimes in reality there are two different numbers, how much pleasure you get from it and how much money you have that can pay. That's definitely true, but I don't want to get into that uh, general thing. So things that in general we're talking about scenarios, let's say inside the computer system you need to allocate something, and we're really talking do you need to pay two micro pennies or one micro penny, okay? So we're thinking about that all of them, so there's no <coughs> upper budget if you wish for people because we're totally talking about very small things within a large system. Yeah, but that's the problem, let's say, with the simplistic model. 
<clears throat> okay, so the problem is, what would you say if that was the rules of the auction, if you wish? Now we can start calling this an auction. So you're asking me how much am I willing to pay? I know in my heart that I'm willing to pay eight. What should I tell the auctioneer? Remember, I'm rational, selfish. What would I say? Okay, so two things. If I knew that this guy was going to say five, I would definitely say 5.1. That's completely clear. But now what will happen if I don't know what he will say? I will sort of have to guess what the other guy is and will you know, maybe do some kind of uh, what is the number that will maximize my expected uh, and so on. Uh, but the point is that I don't know that whatever I do here, it depends on information that I don't know. And this guy will do the other kind, the same kind of thing. And now I will also have to take his action, not only how much it's worth for him, but also what he will do into account. And the whole thing becomes very complicated. And of course, the most important thing, there is no guarantee that the guy who ends up giving a higher number indeed is the guy who wants it more. Question. Yes. Do they have only one shot? This is a one shot thing. No, okay, so I, I'm, I, this is my suggestion number two. In general, you can have other things. No, the point is, how can you tell you more? It's like getting the pleasure or getting the pleasure for the right price. So, in, in my current, in my current uh, level that I'm asking, it's just I want to make sure that these guys get this thing. These guys, oh, what they get, they, when I say uh, that I'm going to charge X dollars for this, this is, of course, X dollars in this unit. So, of course, we are assuming that's an important modeling question here. Of course, I'm assuming, this again goes to back to the question of the budgets of the poor people, that each one of them is trying to optimize getting the item minus the price that you pay. Okay? So, basically, I'm trying to... No, okay, so I'm asking, so, so I'm, I'm specifying more, you're right, this is the thing that involves the, the model, if you wish, that I wasn't completely explicit about. What they're trying to optimize is the value of what they get minus the price that they pay. Okay, so the point is that, you know, I need units for the two different things, for the price and for the value, and of course it's implicit here that they were <coughs> both talking in the same units of measurement. Okay, you may need to convert from one to another in any real scenario, but they're the same unit. Yes? Um, <coughs> yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> I, so what you're saying basically is that you cannot guarantee that they will say the price that it will, what, is, what is worth. worth right. And in fact, I can guarantee that they will not because they're rational. Okay. So I can't really remember. I once had like a course in game theory on mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So here, okay, so let me, since I only have five minutes. Sorry. So here's the answer from the, that game theory course that you took. And it says the following thing. So if you change the rules that I have and use the following rule, that the guy who says the highest, the rule is each of you says how much it's worth for you. The guy who says the higher number wins, but he doesn't pay what he said, but he rather pays the other, what the other guy said. That's called the victory auction or second price auction. And otherwise, the second highest. So this is like the classic situation. And now the really interesting uh, mathematical theorem that it's easy to prove and I won't do it for you, that now every rational player will say the truth. Okay? And that's, that's a basically re in really interesting idea that if I chose very cleverly the rules of interaction here and how much I charge people and who gets what, I can ensure that I know I can basically make sure that players act like I want them to. Basically telling me the truth, and of course once they tell, told me the truth, I can allocate it in the optimal way because I'm so good. Uh, can you explain, because I always thought the victory action is the one shot case of the, I think they call it the Dutch action, where you lower the price. Of the English auction where it goes okay, up yeah, actually. And you were, and I saw that, okay. That no, you're, you, so you're right, I so the Dutch, that's a bad idea. the Dutch auction is a bad idea, the English auction is a good idea. <laughs> okay. Okay, so general thing, so this is like now let's generalize this kind of thing for general uh, 
we have a general problem that we need to allocate resources or basically take some kind of decision that depends that has a, you know that uh, that depends basically what we're going to do depends on many different players each one with his own goals and it affects all of them so we have the general scenario of a mechanism design scenario is that we have agents that are rational selfish and they have private information so I don't know everything about the situation and I now the mechanism designer now this is really the job of the engineer here is going to be the mechanism designer. when we analyze we're going to be in the foot in the shoes of the mechanism designer I may have my own goal for example as previously I just wanted to optimize what's called the social welfare the total sum of happiness of everyone or I may also be interested in my own goals maybe I just want to make as much money as I can and maybe there are other complications and the point is I get to design decide the mechanism and tell everybody how we're going to play once I tell everybody how we're going to play and I also uh, I can, can charge money and of course we will have to have some kind of notions that I can't ask for someone to participate or something like that but in general I can charge money and the mechanism basically what would be a mechanism so there's going to be a protocol that the agents the different pieces of the system will have to participate in I'm going to say what is the outcome as part of that protocol so classical mechanism design that's usually very simple like the highest bidder wins and pays a second price in general in computer systems we're talking about uh, something that may be a very complex algorithm <coughs> and of course we said there are payments and the general setting is that I want to be able and we have many examples where we can get the goal that we want in equilibrium just like previously we're assuming selfishness and equilibrium so that's the general thing let me just uh, talk about uh, uh, one example of the scale of things that we're talking about so there will be some kind of motivation connecting it back to verification so here's uh, uh, here's an auction that ran for a whole year between March 2016 and 2017 in the United States and that auction tried to basically buy spectrum licenses from basically TV stations that almost no one uses uh, you know broad, actually uh, almost no one actually watches TV over the air right now usually it's just cables so they bought spectrum rights from TV broadcasters and sold them to guys who need them basically mobile operators and that's a very complicated thing because things are not connect all organized in exactly the same way for TV than for cable operators and basically that auction was really a big success uh, in particular it uh, made 20 million dollars of revenue of which half went to the TV stations that gave up their licenses and half went to the United States Treasury to decrease the deficit okay so uh, now this kind of thing is very complicated so for example here's one of the problems they needed to solve while they were doing this auction so this is a problem they need to solve all, every, all, all the time so this was a one year long auction so the different cable operators, the TV, different TV stations for a whole year would put bids, take bids, get feedback, put bids, put bids, take feedback and so on from the system and at the end you only get this final solution. It was a very complicated uh, auction and here is some the interference map basically that's saying that you cannot basically uh, allocate both this license and this license because they're connected with the edge. Okay, so this was what, like the map of uh, uh, of constraints that they had you, can give them, you cannot give them to the same uh, no you cannot allocate both of them so you, there's no you cannot buy both from this, this TV station uh, and from that TV station in the same band you need to move one of them to a different band mm -hmm. okay so <coughs> okay so we have so just think about this kind of mechanism uh, <coughs> we have huge amount of money very long very complex mechanism uh, there's a very long process for the auctioneer for the participants uh, there's very hard NP hard problems in, in, the, in, the, in the middle that you also need to uh, and these hard problems some of them are because of physical constraints some of them because of legal constraints uh, so that map that I had it's not that's a physics but it's a combination of physics and law uh, <coughs> and there are further uh, things about the kind of optimizations you can do that works in terms of mechanisms so 
Look at, think about all that thing and think, okay, do we need to verify that things are correct or not? Of course, there is a very complicated, very big thing, and you sort of need to really formally know that this works, and it's not clear even how to think about it. Okay, so the kind of issues that come when you even try to think about it, that first of all, these two that we already had, that we have the selfish parties, we need to be able to know what goes on there. There's a notion of equilibrium that we need to think about, although maybe here we're not talking about equilibrium, but rather about process. It's not clear what we want to do. Uh, how do we handle the private information? Uh, what does it mean that the auctioneer commits? How do we verify the commitment, or we don't need to verify? What does it mean? Uh, the fact that we said we really want the players to do, how are the players going to act? We want it to be some kind of uh, clear for them what they should do. What does that mean even? How do we handle money? Is it just another number in the system that we verify like we verify any other number? Or is this like a special number that we need to verify or may verify in more sophisticated or easier or harder ways? Uh, uh, so these are the types of issues that I think that if you try to think about these types of uh, auctions, you basically, these are the questions that come to me. So thank you. <laughs>